All right. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, today's webinar is going to be uh, the second part to Ben's initial um, rigging for trail work uh, webinar he put on a couple weeks ago. Um, and uh, we're both going to kind of co-host this. And um, as Ben mentioned before, um, we want this to be kind of um, a little bit more of an open discussion. Um, since we do have a lot of people joining us who have experience um, and have been doing this for a bunch of years. Um, so I'll go through um, the PowerPoint and kind of go over some of the basics uh, for the people who are maybe are not as familiar or who need a refresher and we can all be on the same page. Um, and then we'll open it up uh, to just kind of discussion and talking about tips and tricks and things people have found that work or don't work, um, uh, but should be should be good. All right. Um, so hopefully everyone knows how to uh, use the participation uh, in Zoom. There's a little raise hand button. Um, you can raise your hand if you have questions or type questions directly into the chat box. Um, if everyone could just take a minute and just type their name into the chat box, uh, that'll help us just kind of track attendance for who we have uh, with us joining today. <laughs> All right, I think that's that's everybody. Um, okay, great. Um, so just really quick before we get started, um, we just want to say thank you to Subaru um, for sponsoring our webinar series uh, this year. Um, and we will have uh, after this is done, it's being recorded. Um, it'll be up on our website for you to view later um, if you want to view the presentation uh, after the fact. Um, and uh, you know, it's been unfortunate we haven't been able to have any. Uh, on the ground field um, seminars this year, but uh, hopefully next year, depending on how things go, we might be able to get some more in-person uh, trainings. So hopefully that will be coming up um, in the next year. Um, I think most people are pretty familiar with the trail conference. So I'm just gonna quickly skip ahead and um, <laughs> we'll just get into a uh, quick introduction here um, about the hosts. Um, so I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, my name is Tracy Arcella, and I am a uh, field trail builder with the Trail Conference. Um, I joined the staff almost a, a year ago now. Um, I started out uh, with the Conservation uh, Corps program with the Trail Conference. I did uh, two seasons on Bear Mountain. And um, after that, I went and worked for a private trail company up in Maine, and then uh, eventually made my way back down here and uh, joined the staff. Ben, you're muted. muted. There we go. Uh, I'm Ben Sugar. Uh, I've been with the Trail Conference since 2018. Um, and the current, my current title is uh, Senior Trail Builder. Uh, I started building trail in <clears throat> New Hampshire back in 2003. Um, and uh, since then, I have worked for the Green Mountain Club uh, for a couple of seasons, <clears throat> a few seasons in, uh, in Maryland running um, volunteer trail programs uh, for about five years, uh, a couple of seasons with the Forest Service out in Utah, and um, as well as some uh, volunteering for different organizations here and there. So um, off and on for about the last 17 years. Uh, and uh, I'm really glad to be with the Trail Conference. It's a fantastic place to work, and I'm happy to be able to uh, do this for, for a living. It's pretty unique, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, ben, when do you want to do the poll? Have you put that out? It, yet? It's not letting me post the poll. Um, oh, okay. Let me let me see if I can do that. Polls. Um, oh, I think I can do it here. Hold on. Let me do okay. that real quick. Um, so I'm just going to put up this uh, quick poll just to kind of get a feel for um, what everyone else's experience is uh, that we have joining us. Um, see kind of where, where people are at with how much uh, they've used grip hoist and, and rigging and high lines. Yeah. 
and if you know if if everyone has some level of experience that you know saves us a little bit of time and review um, but if um, as I expect it's going to be a pretty wide range of experience levels um, that that tells us something too so okay yeah it looks like we have a, a bit of a mix here uh, so a couple people brand new, um, and we also have some uh, very experienced people with us. So, all right, um, great. Uh, okay, all right. So let's uh, jump into it. Um, so today we're going to kind of break this up into three different uh, sections. Um, we'll first talk about belay lines and knots. Um, then we'll talk about setting up a Highline system. And then lastly, we'll talk about running the Highline system. Um, and then after each of these sections, once I kind of go through some of the, the basics, um, then we'll, for, after each one, we'll open it up for everyone to kind of discuss and, and share their, their thoughts and ideas and, um, and answer any questions anybody might have. If, if anyone's confused as to why we're starting with belay lines and knots, it's because it's unfinished business from the end of the last session. We didn't get to it, so uh, bear with us. Yeah. All right. Um, so just before we jump right in, just a quick recap from uh, the last seminar. Um, ben went over grip hoist winches, um, mechanical advantage, uh, slings and wrapping, locks and pulleys, um, working load limits. Um, I just wanted to check in real quick um, and see if anybody needed a quick refresher. Um, any questions about that before we kind of dive into the new stuff? No? Okay, great. All right, so belays and knots. Um, so a lot of people are familiar with belays from rock climbing. Um, and a belay line is basically just a static line that you're using to secure your load. Um, and this can be a load that's either in the air or one that you have on the ground that you're moving along on a steep slope. Um, and basically what it does, it just allows you to move your load in a very controlled way using friction. Um, and I'll get into kind of a little bit more how, how we do that. Um, but just to note, uh, anytime you're using a Highline system and you have a load up in the air, you wanna make sure you have a belay on your load. Um, the last thing you want is for your load to go flying out of control uh, when it's already up in the air. Um, when you're dragging along a slope, either with grip hoist or if you're moving things by hand, um, it's kind of a case-to-case -case basis and you can kind of assess your risk um, as necessary. So if you're um, working in the back country and the worst thing that would happen if you uh, lost control of your rock is that you have to go find another one, um, it's not highly critical that you have a belay line on there. It's it's helpful, but you maybe don't need to be very careful about having your belay on there. Um, whereas if you're working more front country, you have a lot of hikers um, passing through near your work site, um, the, that risk factor and that danger there is a lot higher. Um, so you wanna make sure you really have your belay line on there and have your load secured before you start moving things along a slope where that load can get away from you. A um, couple of quick things about knots. There's a couple different ones you can use. Um, this is the uh, figure eight follow through. This is the one I use most often for tying on a belay line. Um, it's pretty quick and easy to tie. Um, and just as a note, we like to kind of, each time we use the belay, we'll tie the note, uh, tie the knot fresh. And then at the end of the day, when we're done with it, we'll untie the knot and take that out. Um, so, and I apologize too, um, this is a little bit easier to kind of show in person to demonstrate tying the knots, but um, I'm going to have to kind of show you some pictures instead, unfortunately. Um, so we have the figure eight um, follow through. Uh, the bowline on a bite is another one that's used um, frequently for belay lines. Um, and then once you have your main knot tied, so one of these two, uh, you're also going to want to use a stopper knot after that on that little bit of end line that's left over. Um, for this, you can use either an Ashley stopper or double overhand stopper. I like the double overhand because it's pretty quick and easy to tie. Um, but either one is fine. It's kind of user's choice. Um, and this is an app, this Knots 3D, uh, that you can download onto your phone. And I just wanted to bring that up because 
Um, I find it super convenient. I kind of have trouble learning knots just looking from diagrams. And so this app, you can um, change your perspective. You can slow down the tying of the knot. Um, it's really very helpful. So I just wanted to put that out there. If people are struggling to learn knots. This is kind of a good resource to have. All right. Um, and then just so you can kind of get an image of what this looks like once you have your belay set up, um, you have your load here. Um, and then you have it, uh, your belay lines coming off of this. So you have your main knot here. So that would be your figure eight follow through, say. Um, that loop is shackled to your load here. And then the stopper knot is that knot behind it. Um, and that's how you're going to keep control of your load as you're uh, belaying. Well, um, uh, yeah, just I, I just want to make sure, point out that you definitely want to attach it to the webbing yes. on the load and not onto the hook on your traveling block uh, because that can cause real problems. So be sure that's where you're attaching your belay. Okay. Um, so now that you have your one end of your belay attached to your load, you need to secure the, uh, the other end of your line. Um, for this, we like to use this thing called a quarter wrap. Um, they come in different sizes that'll um, work for different size belay lines. Um, I believe the one we usually use is the uh, 601 LN. Um, so, but you can get a bigger one. The extra large quarter wrap is nice for um, doing some work if you need to end your um, highline system, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so how this kind of looks is when you're setting this up, this longer arm on your quarter wrap is the side that's always gonna be attached to the tree. Um, so this you'll usually do with um, a flat sling and a shackle, just shackle it right onto the tree. Um, and this little slightly bent shorter arm is the side that you're gonna feed your belay rope through. Um, and so what that looks like um, when you're tying this off is kind of this diagram here, I'll do my best to kind of explain this. Um, so you're gonna take out as much tension in the line as you can before you do this. So pull up that slack, take it all out, and you're going to make a loop. That loop's going to come up through that bent arm and then up and over this little bar. After you do that, that line's going to come and wrap around the center tube. Um, but you want to just make sure when you're doing that wrap that you're not doubling back on yourself with the standing end of the line. Um, so you can kind of see here, this is not what you want to do. You want to come forward and over instead of doubling back. Um, and then you pretty much just do a couple wraps. Um, and then a figure eight and a little hitch knot on that bottom bar there. And that'll secure your line um, really well. All right. Um, any questions about belays? Any comments? Oh, sorry. Do you say something, Ben? Uh, Jeff there has a question. Can you oh. un? Ask him to unmute himself. Yep. Oh. Okay, so one of the things I've seen when you have people without experience, you mentioned tightening the belay line. It's important when you tighten the belay line that you have a straight line between the tree or whatever you have the one end secured to and your rock. Often people will take a couple steps to the side and pull tight or stand up too high. So you pull it tight like that. Once you stop pulling, you wind up with slack in the belay line. You have to make sure it's a very straight, direct path when you tighten it. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, pretty intuitive, but I'll, I'll just add that, you know, in looping it around, the number of loops determines the amount of friction. So if you're moving something extremely heavy and you really want to have a good hold on it, you know, throw an extra uh, wrap or two around that center post. But if you've, uh, if you've got something small, if you're not really worried about it and you can let, let out that uh, line a little bit quicker, uh, you only won't need to have maybe two, at most three wraps around uh, your porter wrap. And you know you don't need it. You don't want to tie it off. Otherwise, nothing is going to move. 
but in order to secure the line, that's what you use. All right. Uh, Tracy and Ben, I have a comment on this. And that is with our crew, we generally use uh, a belay line that has a, an eye splice in the end. As you can see here, fairly large eye splice. Splice is actually stronger than tying a knot in it. It's very close to 100% uh, of the breaking strength in the line. And what we, what we normally do is we roll it around into what they call a luggage tag, which uh, is kind of like a, um, um, what, what you do with a, a sling. And we'll actually pass the eye of the sling through here and tighten it around the sling. So you don't need a shackle and this, this works really well and quickly in, in, in taking, uh, in setting it up, in moving something and then taking it off and resetting for another rock. So that's really I, interesting. I, I yeah, strongly recommend that you look yeah. into getting, getting belay lines with a splice put in. Yeah, uh, some of ours are reaching their end of usable life in terms of age and wear. So that's actually really good. I'm going to start writing down some of these ideas because uh, I expect there's going to be enough of them. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, awesome. okay. Yeah. Just throwing that out. So, you, so, you know, but, yep. but it, it definitely increases the, uh, uh, the efficiency of, of taking these on and off. Yeah. The other nice thing that um, Chris has taught me when we do that is if you tighten that cinch as close down to the rock as possible, it helps keep the um, everything tight. Yeah. Let's see. Pen. Um, I can't see the chat, Ben. Are you able to see that? Uh, yeah, I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Thanks. We'll, we'll go ahead then. All right. So yeah, we'll get into uh, some of the more fun stuff. Um, setting up your Highline system. Um, so just real quick for those who um, haven't seen or used a Highline before. This is just a very basic di diagram of what a Highline system is going to look like. Um, and the idea behind the high line is that you're using tension in that line to be able to lift your load and then send it um, send it down along that line. Um, so you're gonna, you know, you tension along your hoist there. You can see that's attached here. Um, that'll tighten the line. Um, your load will move down and then you'll slack that line out and the load will lower back down to the ground down on the other end. Um, so in this system, um, you're going to have two anchor trees and two spar trees or two spars. They don't have to be trees necessarily. Um, on one of those anchors, you're going to have your winch. Um, then you're going to have two blocks, one in each spar. Um, those are going to be up fairly high. And then you're going to have another anchor tree down on your, um, your other end there. Um, and you would also obviously have a belay line attached to your load here as well. Um, but that's just kind of the basic setup um, of what this looks like. Um, so getting into it, um, there's a lot of hardware you need for this. Um, setting up the Highline uh, generally takes a, a pretty good amount of time. A lot of times you'll have to kind of fuss with it, um, fuss with the heights of your blocks, um, what anchor trees you're using, things like that. So it can be kind of a process to get this set up initially. Um, but the main components here that you need are going to be your winch and your handle. Um, we pretty much exclusively use a two-ton winch, which I believe is the TU-28, um, I think. Um, so that's what we typically use. Um, and you're going to want to have your drag line um, for the two-ton. That's going to be your 7 16th uh, inch line. Um, and the drag lines, um, as Ben mentioned in the last uh, webinar, uh, you have one end that's going to be fed into the winch, and then you have another end that has a hook on it there. Um, you're also going to want a line for your system. This can be either an amp steel or a cable. Um, either way, you want to have thimble eyes on both ends of this, this line. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, the amp steel and the, the cables in a minute here. Um, you're also going to need blocks for your spar trees and for traveling to move the load on the line. Um, 
You're going to need a bunch of flat slings um, and eye dies for your trees, uh, shackles, your belay setup, um, and then also means to end the system. Um, this can be a couple of different things. Um, you can use large porter wrap. You can use a, a, a Sourman cable clamp. Um, there's a couple different options, and I'll talk more about those in a minute here as well. Um, and then kind of some optional, sometimes nice things to have if you have them available to you um, can be line extensions. Um, they'll help you kind of adjust the length of your system as needed. Um, and also possibly a two to one block for your hoist um, if you need a little bit more advantage getting your load lifted up. All right. Um, you're also going to want to make sure you have tree climbing gear with you. Um, for OSHA standards, uh, any height above six feet that you're climbing, um, you want to have um, a fall uh, safety system on you. Um, so we use this uh, flip line here um, that's used by Arborists. Um, and this clips uh, around the tree, it goes around the tree and clips onto either side of your, your belt there um, on your harness. And you can, it's nice, you can kind of adjust the length easy and you loop it up as you go up your tree ladder up into the tree. And that just keeps you from being able to fall backwards off of that ladder. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit more about um, some of the line options for your Highline system. Um, so you can use, as I mentioned, the wire cable, um, and this is the less expensive option. Uh, the downside to this is that the wire cables are very heavy. Um, so if you have any kind of a hike into your work site, um, it can be tough to take very long stretches of, of wire line up there to use. Um, so the option that we like to go with uh, in general is this Amp Steel Blue. It has, it's just as strong as um, using a steel line, but at about one seventh of the weight. Um, so it is more pricey, but if that's something you're able to um, afford um, for setting up your system, uh, I definitely recommend that um, if you're able to. Um, and then options for terminating your system. Um, you might get lucky and your line might be just the right length and you can just shackle it right onto your anchor tree on the far end. Um, but a lot of times that's not the case. Um, so if you're looking to adjust a wire cable length on your terminating end, um, you can, I couldn't find a great picture of it. Um, but this is what's called a Sourman uh, clamp. And it basically lets you add a terminal point anywhere along that line. Um, and how it works is you can kind of see this, um, this piece up here basically gets hammered into the main piece and it, it pinches and, and catches on your cable there. Um, and then you have a shackle here that you can, you can use as your little terminating end. Can I just point out, um, yes. as opposed to, we like the, the Sourman's or Crosby makes one called the Terminator. Um, and the way they tend to hold the wire is kind of grabbing it around the entire circumference or close to it, as opposed to some of the other uh, older types like a, a Klein grip or a, what we used to call a little mule, which are plates that will squish the wire rope and potentially damage it. Um, with enough force. And also in my experience, they have problems slipping. So we like to use those, although they are heavy mothers. They're like 15 pounds, something like that. And yeah. each different wire diameter has its own specified. I guess, turn on the video. Yeah, they, they are only uh, good for the uh, steel, steel wires too. You can't use them on am steel or anything else right. like that. Yeah. Right. So at that point, something like your Sourman your, your uh, porter wrap or yeah another uh, rope terminating method you can do things with double uh, uh, double shackles and stuff like that but anyway but yeah you can, yeah 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 that's a good point you can kind of see her here in the picture on the right um, there's the the amp steel if you wanted to use that on your your terminating end um, with one of those extra large porter wraps uh, attached to the tree. Um, that's a good option. Um, you just wanna make sure you can get a lot of wraps around that center column if you're planning to do that. You wanna make sure that's really, really well secured on there. Um, but that is another option you can do as well. Um, okay. 
Okay, and then so here's a just kind of a little bit um, more detailed diagram. Um, and the, the main point um, just showing here is just that as you're thinking about setting up your system, um, one of the things to consider is that you generally want your anchor um, to spar angle uh, to be as low as possible. Um, so I, I circled here and read what those angles are. So this, this one here and four here. Um, if you can try to get it not much over 20 degrees, um, that's just something to keep in mind as you're, you're setting up your system. Um, another thing to consider is your alignment um, of your spars and anchors. The best option um, when you're setting this up is to get as much of a straight line system as possible. Um, it is possible to have your, your spars slightly offline. Um, and you can kind of see this in the second picture where you would then use some guidelines to kind of counteract um, the side force on, on the trees there. Um, but whenever possible, if you can get that straight line system, um, that's really going to be your ideal. Does anyone here have experience using uh, guy lines to support you know, and, and counteract side loading? Personally, I, I've never, I've just avoided using them. We, we, we have done it once uh, and it was because the alignment, uh, we, you know, we were in a swamp area and basically the line, in order to get the line to lay step stones along our alignment so we didn't have to muck around with them in the mud, uh, they were coming in from the side. So we basically had to, uh, you, you, get the, you get the thing going and then you actually use the, the uh, uh, the sideline to put, to bend bend the high line basically around and pull it back into alignment. Hmm. Interesting. We we've used um, guy lines at times with uh, fairly small spar trees in, in order to keep them in line. Yes. Uh, it just it depends a lot on the on the size of the spar tree. We've, we've had we've had some spar trees a lot a, a lot recently that are. Uh, that are large enough that we can anchor directly to the spar tree way up in the air and not have and not pull the tree over. Yeah. It, it all depends on its size. Exactly. Yeah. And that's uh, interesting to, to point out down there on this diagram on, on the right hand side, you've got like back anchors for it. So you've got maybe smaller trees for your anchors. Instead, you're actually bracing. So those are kind of guidelines for the anchor. Uh, I've done that a couple of times, but again, it's it's adding more hardware, uh, and it is it can be kind of dicey getting the uh, getting the the force balanced out. But that is something you can do if you don't have very good uh, options for an anchor. That may be right. true, but but a lot of times when when we anchor to a small spar a small tree. If you anchor it close enough to its root system, it's very yeah. strong. It's it's amazingly strong. How how much you could put on a small small tree if you get it down near the, near its root system. Right. All right. Yeah. So so talking about that a little bit more. Um, just in general, you know, you want to be careful choosing your your spar and anchor trees, um, and you know, always avoid trees that are they're dead or have um, significant rot or lean to them. Um, anything that's too small, um, anything that has dead sections that could potentially come down once you put uh, tension on that system or that have weak root systems. Um, and this will really depend on where you're working and, and what the trees are like. A lot of times if you're up at, at higher, uh, higher levels of um, say up on a mountain or, or cliffside, um, you know, the higher up you go, the, the weaker the rooting of your trees up there is. And that's a, that's a problem we've run into before with just having very shallowly rooted trees that weren't suitable for running systems. Um, so you wanna just be very careful about that um, when you're setting up your system and, and looking at what trees you wanna use and uh, what your options are. Um, and so, uh, <coughs> having said that, um, if you don't have suitable trees, um, there are other options. Um, 
So using a tripod is, uh, I think, probably the most the most common uh, option that you can use. Um, and there's different ways you can set this up, different um, types. Um, I like this picture on the left here, just because it's uh, three strap logs together. Um, I've never used that system, and I don't think I would necessarily want to. Um, but it's kind of cool that you can kind of make this work even way out in backcountry if you don't have a tripod with you. Um, but more commonly, you'll see um, a prefabricated metal tripod, either steel or aluminum. Um, you can kind of see here, there's no trees and they're using these uh, tripods as uh, spars and anchoring off of, I assume, the big rocks that are back behind there. Um, the tripod that we used uh, for our systems is aluminum, which is really nice. Um, it's a little bit lighter weight and easier to kind of hike into your work site. Um, and it also has adjustable legs, which is a nice feature if you're looking to build or get a new tripod. Having that adjustable uh, leg system on there makes it a lot easier. Um, it's nice to have flat ground, but it's very rare that you're going to have a nice, perfectly flat area to put your tripod. So being able to adjust those legs easily is, um, is a nice feature to have. Um, yeah. Yes. So I'll add, I also really enjoy, I like that it's uh, load rated by the manufacturer so that I know what we're working with, with when every other part of our system is load rated, uh, that we have a rating for that component too. Um, yeah, so some, some other things to consider when you're looking at using a tripod um, as your spar. Um, one is, um, well, in general, you don't want to side load your system as much as possible. You want to avoid that. Um, but if you are using a spar tree, you have a, a little bit more leeway um, in terms of getting your load up in the air. Um, but with the tripod, that's really not there at all. Um, any kind of side loading is really easy to topple over that tripod. Um, so when you're setting up your system and getting your load ready, you really have to be careful and make sure you're really getting your load right underneath that line um, so that as you lift, you're not pulling sideways on that system. Um, also, just be aware it can be difficult to get stability with your tripod when you're on sloped ground. Um, that's kind of where the adjustable legs come in and are helpful um, to help you balance that out with your tripod. Um, and also, you have a little bit more limited height options if you're using a tripod that can only go so tall. Um, I think the one we use maxes out at 13, 14 feet, something like that. Um, um, so just, just be aware of that when you're, you're looking at a tripod um, to potentially use. Um, some other safety considerations with the tripod. Um, as you're setting that up, you want to make sure the distance between your legs, um, so that's shown as A here, um, that should be no more than 75% of the extended leg length. Um, so if you're, you know, if you had your leg length up at 10 feet, um, you want this distance between your legs to be no more than seven and a half feet. Um, another thing to note is you usually want the two legs um, on your triangle to be forward. Um, and by that, I mean closer to the direction that your load is moving and farther from the side where the grip hoist is. Um, you're not going to get that perfectly aligned because your line obviously would hit from the grip hoist. Um, but you want those two legs more towards the front than towards the back, if that makes sense. Um, in addition, um, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, you know, no more than 75% or should yes. that be no less than 70? Uh, no more. Okay. Than it's to avoid um, too much lateral load on the on the legs, which which could bend it. So you're you're trying to strike a balance between stability uh, from toppling over and um, making sure that you're you're not starting to bow those legs from downward force. Okay, uh, well, that's my assumption. Well, what is the um, minimum that you would have for stability? It's, I don't know. Do you, do you know Ben? No, I, that's actually a really good question. Um, you know, we only started dipping our toes into into tripod use pretty recently, uh, 
to be honest. And that's that's generally hadn't been a consideration. Um, I, I tend to want to get them pretty out and wide for the most part in order to get it as stable as possible. So I, I think we were riding that line between, you know, 60 to 75 percent of that width in order to make sure that we've got as stable of a setup as possible. Yeah, pretty much every time we set it up, we try to get it as close to that that 75 as we could. Yeah. Sacrifices some height though, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so other things to consider. Um, once you get your tripod set up and, and aligned and positioned the way you want, um, I would suggest putting tension on your system um, with no load on it, just to test out and see um, if just putting tension is gonna pull your tripod at all. Um, they can be a little bit fussy. So running it without a load and just getting that tension in there and seeing maybe what leg is moving where you need to adjust um, is super helpful. Um, so that's a good thing to do before you start. Um, another thing to note, um, if you're running your, your, your line uh, cross slope is to keep your belay line uphill of the tripod. And this is because if you can imagine um, you have your, your load tied off on the belay. As it lifts up, if your belay line is downhill, that load, as soon as it comes off the ground, is going to swing downhill, and that will topple your tripod right away. Um, so this isn't something you really have to consider if you're using trees as spars, but with the tripod, make sure you have that belay line um, always uphill of where the tripod's located. Um, yeah, and in general, just be aware that the tripod can fall, um, especially when you're putting the tension on the line uh, initially when you're testing out the system. So just make sure that everybody is kind of clear of that fall zone from where that thing could fall over. Okay. Um, and then just a, a quick note about anchoring options. We kind of, Ben mentioned this before, um, but you can, you know, if you don't have um, suitable anchors, um, for one large tree, you can use a multiple anchor system um, or a backup system like you see here to um, counteract some of that force on your tree, um, if that's something you're worried about. Um, all right, so I think that's that's it for the, the setup portion of it. Um, so we'll kind of open that up to anybody who wants to talk some more about setups or if anybody's used tripods before and they have some, some tricks and tips about getting those set up efficiently. Um, I will uh, simply add that in, in terms of that initial tensioning uh, and, and checking the system, uh, that's in my mind something that you, that you should do no matter what your system is. Um, and then I like to post people uh, and assign them to watch individual parts of the system, especially the spar trees, to see if, if they start to, you know, rather than just shutter, shuttering's fine under the increased load, but if they start to move and don't bounce back, then you've, you know, you've got something wrong with your system somewhere uh, and you need to restart. Um, but generally, especially the spars, but also checking the anchors, making sure nothing's moving that shouldn't be moving. Um, and then you can, you know, after that dry run, get the operation, start moving rocks. Yeah. Hey, Ben. Yes, sir. One of those tripod pictures showed a tarp on the ground. Was that strictly to protect the wire rope as you were pulling over the rocks? I think so. That that wasn't a picture from, from one of our groups, but I think it's just to protect the rope so it's not dragging along the rocks there. Although uh, we, you know, we did wrap, um, yes, I didn't do this, Tracy did it, uh, wrap the grip hoist, um, so put your in in a, in a small tarp to protect it from any rain um, when it wasn't in use, um, if it was set up but not in operation. So that, yeah, that is- Yeah, I always like to tarp it. Um, and that's a, another thing too, when you're, um, when you're done with your Highline system for the day, um, you wanna retension your hoist and have your system at, at full tension um, and then take your, your handle out um, before you, you head out of there. I mean, Lester uh, Kenway suggests, you know, just disassembling it and resetting it up every day. I don't think we'd ever get anything done if uh, 
if we had to do that each time, we're just not that efficient. Maybe other crews are, but um, you know, if, if you've got your system designated, then I suppose you could do that, but that's a lot of work. Uh, and I've yet to encounter anyone successfully messing with any of our uh, tension systems overnight. What, what we, we did once in a place where we wanted to leave the, the high line because it was an uproar to set up, uh, what we did was we would, I tensioned it and then put a length of chain, you know, I tensioned it up really tight, put a length of chain snugly in parallel with the, the, the winch itself back to the tree and then release the winch, the chain picked up the tension and I could take the winch away. So at least I didn't have to leave the winch out in the woods. Uh, huh. and, and so we did that. And, um, and by, by and large, I mean, we work on one day work trips and there's no way I'm gonna leave that stuff set up and hung up in the tree, particularly with the fabric ropes, uh, you know, for a week. Yeah, these nickel nutheads will come up with a with a Bowie knife and oh, I'll cut it and point and then yeah. well, you know you're well, shot. We did for the terrace pond project. We left it up for the. Duration. We we left it up, but it was you know forty feet in the air. No, you couldn't get anywhere near it. Um, yeah. But and that was also a four hundred foot line. I wasn't going to restring that every time. <laughs> but the um, uh, yeah, you've got a, a a question, and I don't know if you're going to do it later, and if so, just you know, we'll, we'll do it. But the thing about how high you spar, uh, because the angle down to your load from the spar, uh, both in terms of getting it so the, the rock will run for you so you don't have to drag it across, but also just the more angle you can get, the steeper that V coming to the rock is, the more lift you get. Do you have that later, Tracy, or? Um, I, I don't have, I was going to bring it up when talking about um, okay. shackling your load, but um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. We can yeah, talk about we're, we're going to get into oh, that. No, but, okay. but so how is that consistent with your 20% angle from the 20 anchor, degree. what yeah. 20 degree angle from the anchor to the spar if you want the spar super high. It just means you have to have a really long run between the spar and the and the and the winch. Or or uphill. Uh, sometimes yeah. you can cheat a little bit if your upper spar or if your upper angle, yeah, upper anchor is uphill of your spar. Um, you can you can dead end in your anchor without that much run. Um, but yeah, typically that's that's why the amount of wire rope and cable needed is often longer than the the functional like middle portion of your system that may only be 150 feet but you may need you know 300 total feet of uh of actual line in order to run that out with and keep your angles correct earlier you mentioned uh with a very heavy load doing a two to one uh uh, mechanical advantage, how would you set the winch up for that? Um, so you, you basically set the winch um, the same as you would on your anchor. Um, and you have your, your block attached um, basically via shackle to the end of your line. So instead of having the winch line hooked directly to your high line line, you're going to have that run through the block, which is attached to your line. And then attached back on the anchor. So I I'd you're doubling it between the spar tree and the anchor tree. Uh, yes. If I could, if I could comment about that, that's what we normally use on the long distance trails crew because we uh, we use we normally use a TU seventeen for uh, all our our work, but we're you we're working in loads that would be similar to the TU twenty eights and. We have a we have a doubler block that we use uh, going to the grip hoist. The the end so it has two ends that are going to the anchor tree. Yeah. Yeah. We, hoist. we 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 do that also most of the time. Uh, we use it. We use a doubler block unless we're doing the really lightweight stuff. Yeah. Uh, right. we, we use a doubler block. Now, what I do, I try not to bring the 
uh, the 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 comeback from the from the wind from the pulling cable uh, to the same anchor tree. I try to bring it off to the side a little bit, but that's just to avoid having the person operating the winch being in the fly line of that block if it comes loose. It pulls it pulls the bite off to the side a little bit. If I might make another comment to you about the difference between using the steel cable and the Amstel, um, we, we have both in our crew, but uh, for most of the work, we're leaving the high line set up for weeks at a time. And you just can't leave uh, Amstel out in the, in the, the environment like that uh, for, the, for the one reason is it's, it, it is degraded by, um, by UV over time. And uh, we, we, that's one thing. And the second thing is it's also not, not, as, not as durable in terms of uh, dragging it over things. And we, did, we use the, side, the high line with side loads a lot of times around trees and things like that. that you really have to be careful with the, the friction of, uh, of, of the Anstel. Uh, in terms of, of what it what it's uh, what it's rubbing against. Yeah, that's a good point. It's very useful if we had to do a one day trip and you have to carry everything in. I mean, it, the weight difference is is uh, is spectacular, but we have to we have to look at um, at the durability in, in terms of what we're we're doing. Or if I'm coming out that day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jeff. All right. Um, I guess let's uh, move on then to running the High Line. Um, so I had, uh, hold on, I had a video of a High Line going. Let me see if I can pull that up really quick. Um, Yeah. See, I couldn't get this to embed in the PowerPoint, but hopefully this will this will work. Um, maybe. Oh. Is this the one that sped up? Uh, no. Oh, I don't know. It's not quite uh, quite going here. Um. All right. This this might be a no go. Um, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, we'll, we'll forget about that. Um, but yeah, you can see our little uh, tripod here in the corner. Um, all right, let me go back to the, the PowerPoint. Sorry about that. I thought that would, uh, that would open there, but it's not. Okay, so we'll, we'll go past that. Okay, um, so the first thing you're gonna wanna be concerned with is uh, securing your load for the high line. Um, so as always, you know, make sure your slings are all intact. You wanna look for that red line, um, make sure none of that showing through wear on your, your slings, especially in a high line system. You wanna be very particular and making sure that you're not using any kind of overly worn out um, slings to strap up your load. Um, so you're going to wrap this securely. Um, you can do this a couple of ways. You can use, if it's small enough, you can use a rock net. Um, we like to use this longer thing down here um, called a boulder sling. Um, those are kind of nice to have for bigger rocks. Um, or you can package wrap with um, your round slings that you have. Um, and as you're doing this, you want to wrap this so that there's as little extra sling available as possible on your wrap. Um, so what that looks like, you want to have your, your traveling block be basically as close to your load as possible. So more like this and less like this, where you have this long line here um, between the, the block and your actual load. Um, and like we just mentioned uh, before, um, this kind of ties into having those higher up spar trees. Um, that in combination with keeping 
this load close to the line, um, oops, sorry, is uh, what's going to let you lift that load um, without having to overexert on your hoist. Um, the lower the spars and the farther your your load is from that line, um, the more effort you're going to have to exert on that hoist um, to get your load up high enough to travel. And uh, the more you do that, the, the more likely you get to, to shearing your, your pins on your rip hoist, which you don't want to have happen. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a bunch of math with that. And I think there's some charts, which I don't think I have on here. Um, that kind of go into the, the angles and those loads. Um, maybe we can bring that up after. But um, the main idea is uh, it's just higher spars and, and close to the line with your load as possible um, to, to maximize your effort. Um, so once, once you're wrapped up, you're attached to your traveler block, um, you're gonna make sure your belay is also attached to your load, make sure it's hooked up on the side sling and not on your uh, traveling block itself. Um, something we like to do sometimes is adding a another sling um, tied onto your, your load as basically a leash. Um, and that can be helpful on the receiving end. Um, sometimes if you don't get enough height there to, to send your load down, the load can get a little bit stuck um, part of the way down. And that just helps you be able to pull your load down the line if you need to. Um, as well as pulling it, kind of adjusting a little bit on the far end as you're lowering it down if you need to pull a little bit offline to, to get it to land where you want it to go. Um, and yeah, like we mentioned, you want to avoid sideloading the system as much as possible. So getting your load once it's wrapped up um, as directly underneath the line as you can um, before you start lifting that up. Um, and then before tensioning the line, um, Make sure your belay is uh, securely tied off and make sure you move as much slack from that belay as well before you start tensioning your line. Um, you also want to make sure nobody's in the V of death and this is just kind of general to your Highline system. Um, and the, the way I've read about it is that you kind of picture a, a slingshot almost and if you know you have this system under tension and if one of those parts were to fail and that line would come slinging out like a slingshot, you want to not be in an area where that would catch you and, and hit you. Um, so for example, you know, as you're tensioning up and raising your load, uh, don't be standing right near your spar and your load that's that's getting lifted up into the air. Um, and, uh, you know, the, it, there's so much tension in this line. Uh, there's lots of, you know, different ways it can fail. Um, so you want to just be very careful um, always with using this system. Um, always be wearing hard hats. And if you don't need to be close to the system, don't don't be, basically. Um, I'll also add um, one problem is, is uh, the V of death on the receiving end. Um, oftentimes, the people receiving the rock and letting it down uh, they have to often spend at least a little time in that zone. And so uh, what I try and do is, is make sure there's no additional tensioning that's, that's happening when anyone has to be in that zone. So at the very least, uh, they're in that zone when it's tension is being removed and the risk is decreasing, uh, you know, from one, one moment to the next. Um, uh, going... Yes. Going back one second, you know, in addition to the via death, if somebody's working a belay line, you don't want to be on the side of that in the direction your rock is going to travel. Yeah. You, know, you don't want to get pushed over as everything moves down the line. Yeah, that's a good point as well. We will frequently use the belay you know, you set the belay up tight uh, and then start lifting your rock. And we make a point of holding the belay until the rock is airborne. Because yeah. otherwise there's a tendency for the rock as it begins to lift up, particularly if you've got a lot of slope on your high line, uh, the, the rock will start to sort of walk down the hill uh, 
bumping into things, beating up on the sling, whatever, uh, or coming loose. And uh, whereas if you hold the belay until the until it's actually in the air sufficient to begin moving clearly, then once you've got it up at elevation, then you can start to let it go. Yeah, that's a really good point. We we do that as well. We make sure we tie off, um, you know, pull that that tension up as much as you can and then tie it off on your belay until it's fully up in the air. And there, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, one of which is one of the best benefits of a high line is it's, if it's done right, it's a lot lower impact than just dragging rocks all over the landscape or rolling them and rock barring them and moving them by hand. Um, so, but if you're gonna have, you know, have rocks letting a rip um, you know, bouncing all around the ground or, or just letting them zoom down without a belay, crashing into trees and damaging, that defeats the whole purpose in terms of uh, reducing impact. Uh, and and uh, on a related note, we do, if there's any areas that are high risk for, you know, trees um, getting bumped by rocks on the line, uh, we, we do sometimes tie, um, sections of carpet or bits of scraps of tire will will attach those to the sides of trees or fire hoses. Yeah. Fire hose. there's there's a lot of different things you can use you can even fold up a tarp and a t and you know use a ratcheting strap uh and put that on the side of a tree to protect it if need be yeah all right um okay um so with your system as well, you wanna make sure um, that you're using calls to communicate um, between your, your hoist end of the system and the receiving end, um, basically. Um, so the tension, hold, and slack, that's the same as you would use anytime you're using your grip hoist. Um, and you wanna make sure you're calling and then repeating the, the call as that happens. Um, with the high line specifically, um, you also want to use rock on the line. So we use that call once the rock um, is up in the air. So it's tied off and it's being held there up in the air, um, being ready to send down to, send down to the uh, receiving end. Um, the, the receiving end um, might need to call all clear. This is a good one to have if you're working in an area where there's some foot traffic. Um, you might have to have somebody uh, else directing uh, traffic and stopping people from passing by the system. Um, this is a problem we've had um, working on our, our site, uh, one of our sites last year, where there was a, a pretty high traffic volume of hikers. Um, so we had to have one person specifically stationed to keep people from coming and passing past the High Line as we were operating it. Um, and then I also like to use uh, rock on the ground on the receiving end. Um, this is useful if you're in a setup where you can't, you don't have clear visual line of sight between your, your two ends. Um, calling rock on the ground on your receiving end uh, tells your person slacking the hoist that they can stop slacking. Um, I've had people not call that and you, you know, slack way too much slack out of your hoist. And then you have to tension it all back up again, it takes, takes a lot longer if you put too much slack in there. Um, so having that call as well is useful. Um, and we like to use walkie talkies. It's, you can get a cheap pair of walkie talkies um, and that's a really useful thing to have as well when you're, you're running this system. Um, if it's super windy, there's, there's other outside noise. It's just nice to be able to use that instead of screaming down the hill. As far as uh, protocol, we're generally saying tension hoist Mm -hmm. or tension polar slack hoist slack um belay yes. so just to say yellow command tension or hold it should really be followed by whatever device because in general you're going to have at least a belay sometimes an extra polar or whatever when you're working so it helps to always get in the habit of defining what the device is yeah absolutely <laughs> In, uh, in general, I think that the biggest thing in terms of the terms you use is make sure they don't sound like one another and make sure you're consistent. Um, and, that's, and that only certain terms are used and you know that certain people are calling them out. There should be only one person doing the call and one person doing the response.
Um, all right. Yeah, so just a couple, couple other small notes. Um, you want to keep an eye on your load as you're doing that initial tensioning. Um, sometimes the load and the rock can shift inside the sling and it might shift to a position where it has the potential to slide out or fall. Um, so always keep an eye on that as, as your rock is lifting. And if it does shift um, and, and look unsafe, you know, lower it back down, re-tie up your, your line, re-wrap it, um, and, then, and then tension it up again. Um, and then, you know, when you're letting out your belay, do it slowly. You don't want your rock flying down that line really fast at, at your um, coworkers on the other end. Um, so you want to do a slow let out of your belay line um, and then make sure you're receiving it nose to uh, tell your tell your hoist end when to slack and, and let the line down when your your load is in the proper position. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that was it for that. Um, kind of open it up to, to more discussion about operating the Highline system. This is a bit general, but uh, it's, it's worth maybe adding um, when you're doing your initial rock wrap, especially if you're just using more standard, uh, you know, just some basic uh, round slings, some some uh, tough flex. Um, it's worth trying to anticipate how that rock is going to shift, how the center of gravity is going to, you know, head to the down position as it starts to lift and anticipate what that's gonna to do to the hold your sling has. And if you can anticipate that and head it off with your initial wrap, you can save yourself um, some, some work, you know, having to rewrap your rock uh, because it, you know, started to slip. Two things that might actually be intuitive is when you first set up the high line, before you really start moving anything, know where the center point of the high line is so you can always judge the direction your rock's going to travel you know where you pick them up on the high line they're generally going to travel to the middle and the second one is you know safety if you th if you're looking at something oh i think it'll be okay that means stop and re-rig it don't take the chance Yes, definitely. Um, this is, a, I guess it's worth noting that there is an interesting um, exception in terms of uh, the height of your spars that may come into play sometimes. And this is a more of a general comment about understand how topography, especially if it's not a homogeneous slope, if the slope changes over the course of the run of your system, that may affect how easily your rock is going to be able to clear, you know, obstacles. You don't want to put, you know, design your system with a huge outcrop right in the middle that you're going to have an extremely hard time getting over or around. Um, and also, and this has happened to me once uh, years ago, if there is a sudden drop off um, before the end of your system, that's the one case where you may want your lower spar to be a bit lower um, in order to avoid what happened to me, which is every single rock that we flew down would get to the end of the system and would have to be lowered way down in order to get it to the ground. Uh, really, really negatively impacted efficiency of the system. It ran very slowly. So we could have gotten away with the lower spar in that case um, and it would have run much faster. Um, because one of the things is you're not usually moving one or two rocks. You're usually, you know, you want to get eight, 10, 12 rocks because it's a pain in the, in the butt to set that thing up for just a couple of things to move. You want to be able to, you know, get a production line going moving material. Uh, ben, if I could make a comment on that, there are times when we've been working downslope quite a bit and we've run run a high line that runs runs quite a bit up, quite a bit downhill, uh, moving material downhill down the high line. 
it, it calls for a very, very strong belay because you're, you're picking it up and then you're, you're basically lowering down the high line with a lot of force on the belay yeah. and setting it down again. And it, that, that works very well, but you really have to plan the high line out to move materials down like that. I know when the, uh, when the Jolly Rovers and I was involved with it were, were building steps over at Fitzgerald Falls, they were, they were moving materials down uh, almost as far downhill as they were moving laterally. And uh, it was interesting. We were really, uh, really working the high line and the belay very carefully to, to move things down. Con conversely, we just did a, a stone staircase uh, where the rocks, the entire supply of rocks in the region was at the bottom of the staircase. Oh my God. Yeah. And then, you, and then you're pulling everything uphill. <laughs> yeah. Well, what we, what we did was we just put the, the origination spar basically as high up the spar tree point, the pick point was as high as the top step was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. You want to, you want to, and then want to draw yeah. it up the hill as, as you're pulling. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, no, we just, we just belayed back against it and wound, yeah. brought it up as high as you could. And then you basically just, we still ended up pulling it uphill a bit, but it was a lot less than we would have otherwise. Done that too. So in that case, would you be uh, using a second uh, grip hoist to uh, pull up an incline? If you, uh, you not not if, if you can get yeah, not you if you can to. get the not if you can get the, the the line up high enough in the tree on the downhill side, and you may be just just setting it on an anchor at the base of a tree uphill, and then pulling it uphill. Yeah, the the, yeah. the 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 object of the game, if you can, is to get the starting point for your rock, the spar at the starting point for your rocks, higher than the spar at the receiving end, mm. uh, and and so that that once the t once the line goes up, it's quote unquote downhill to the receiving end. What that does mean is you got a lot more crank to go because we had to we had to go forty <laughs> feet up before we did anything across. Well, it's always harder to move uphill. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. but yeah. it beats dragon. It still beats dragon. And oh, absolutely. Back, in the, back yeah. in the dark ages, that's all we did because we only had one pulley. <laughs> yeah. I also would assume that. Uh, with some of the diagrams that have uh, uh, from the spar, uh, spar trees uh, steep angle down to where the load is, that when you start cranking it up into the air, that your uh, strongest position is when it first leaves the ground and that it must get harder and harder and harder to, uh, to get it to the point where the high line is, uh, is getting close to being straight. Oh, well, straight high line is much harder. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's so, diminishing returns. Um, yeah, it, essentially it starts getting, uh, I don't know if it's, I would say exponentially, you have to keep pouring in more and more tension into that line in order to get that next inch of lift. Uh, because so much more of the work is just being, force is being put just into the wire rope rather than into direct lift. Uh, and so, you know, in order to lift a 500 pound rock, you're using thousands of pounds of force. Mm -hmm. It's not the most sufficient way, you know, to, to do work in the sense of physics, but it is, you know, a, a way to get indirect lift. And that's, that's the whole point. Yeah, the, so the, the limiting factor will be your, your, your hoist's uh, uh, shear pin. Yeah. Um, and it, it is theoretically that like you can have a very long system um, with you know 400 uh, feet of rope or what have you, but it is it starts to become harder to traverse long distances and have that starting point be a nice acute V instead of closer to uh, you know 
straight at the beginning unless the topography is really in your favor. Um, so oftentimes uh, we have some 300 and 400 foot rope, uh, you know, uh, Highline cable. Um, I haven't used them yet. Uh, we tend to, I think, end it out around 250 most of the time if we can get away with it because there's not just the, the angle of tension uh, to consider, but also the wire rope itself has a, you know, has weight in and of itself. So especially if you're not using the amp steel, at a certain point, you're not just lifting the weight of the rock, you're also lifting the weight of all the rope that's between your spars. Um, and normally that's not a huge deal, but it does have an upper limit to where it starts to become prohibitive. That's the catenary in the wire rope, yes. Yeah. All right. Um, ben, anything else that I, that I missed? That... Oh, well, you know, I'll only say that it, you can, this really is something, uh, I, I like to call this series uh, of webinars, topics that are better taught in person, in the field. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is yet another one that it, it's really um, much more illuminating to just go out and set up a, design a high line and start cranking and, and flying rocks. Uh, however, we, you know, we're not doing that now. So this is a, a good kind of like introductory primer and just, you know, for me, this is a, a cool way to, to you know, um, do some shop talk with other people who, who run Highline systems. Uh, but there is a lot more that you can go into and, and discuss. Um, and I look forward to when the pandemic's over, um, you know, uh, hosting some, some more workshops uh, for this in the field. Um, I have, uh, we have lots of materials that we can send to those of you who are relatively new to this. Uh, we have a, a rigging handbook for the trail conference that Eric Mickelson um, created, uh, I think about five years ago. And that has a lot of materials that we pulled from for this, um, as well as uh, some other materials that could be useful. Um, but also I, I'm planning on uploading not only this webinar is going on to the cloud, but also uh, uploading and sharing the um, slideshows as well on the cloud in order so people can access them if they, if they find them useful. Um, and our, uh, our contact information is on the NYNJTC website. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, um, or suggestions, uh, feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, ben, I, I believe in the first session, you um, did mention that the labels on the slings all had working load limits, but um, I'm not sure you mentioned that when you sling rocks and set them up, not to have the pressure point where the label is. Yes, good point, I did forget that. Um, yeah, you want your, if you got it in a choke or if you've got it in, in any sort of wrap where portions are overlapping, you want to make sure that <clears throat> that, that label is unobstructed. Um, it's, not, it's not being impacted by any sort of choker bite or anything similar. And ideally you want it visible for anyone to see. And as always, you should be able to read any of the ratings that are on there. And speaking of sling ratings, it is really important um, I say the, the most important thing in terms of load rating for your system to keep an eye on is the, um, the slings that are holding up your spar blocks. Make sure that you have robust enough uh, flat slings, not round slings on your trees because those can move really easily. Nice thick flats, uh, eye to eye or um, endless loop flat slings that are rated especially if you're doing like a two to one with, with a two time, which is what we were doing um, to move some pretty large stuff that you're not exceeding what those slings are rated for, particularly in something like a choke. Um, anyone else have any thoughts? Uh, Tracy, uh, some of the diagrams you were showing us were not 
from the rigging handbook. Uh, is there a, a second handbook that you're working from? That um, I pulled from a couple different places. Let me let me see what that uh, that title was. Um, but we can send that out as well. That one was from mm -hmm. Ben. Do you remember where that other? Which one? Uh, let me see if I can find. For it. instance, the uh, the one on wrapping with the yes. different slings. That was from. Let's see. Um, uh, so yes, that was another guide. Um, intro to, to rigging for trail work. There's a shorter guide. I don't know who puts that out um, though, but we can send that out as well. Um, that has some little pictures in that. Um, I pulled some stuff from there. Uh, Lester Kenway's um, catalog also has some um, different uh, diagrams and, and things in there. So I know I pulled a couple from, from that as well. Um. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say uh, you're not talking about this uh, uh, catalog, are you? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. H half of that catalog is is just teaching people what in the heck the stuff is and how you're supposed to use it. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to share my screen really fast. Um, one thing that. We, we didn't get so this is the table I was re, uh, we were referring to so cable angle from vertical on the left in terms of how V like or how straight it is and the percent of the force that's actually supporting the load versus cable tension um, and if you look on the right as that angle goes up the force exerted on the cable really skyrockets uh, once you get above about like 70 degrees from vertical. Um, so it starts to go up really fast. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments? Uh, Tracy, were those pictures that you showed, were they from the, uh, the work that was done on the Washburn Trail? Uh, some of them were, yes. Yeah, okay, nice work. Oh, thank you. Have you been up there to see it? I, I have, I, I hike up there regularly. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, you, those guys moved some, they flew some really big yeah. rocks. Some of them I was, I was shocked that they actually were able to get that up enough to, uh, yeah. to, to send down the system. I was skeptical. <laughs> well, you should see some of the rocks that we've moved on the, uh, the work that we've done on the upper Nyack trail. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. A yeah. lot of rock. We must. We in um, in six months. I'm I'm estimating we moved about twenty tons of rock. Wow. Okay. Well, um, again, we're you know we're available if anyone wants to uh, talk shop on hoisting and rigging, um, and you know especially for uh, for those of you who are you know the experienced hands. Um, sharing experience and, and tips. That was really uh, fantastic to have you guys. I was really pleased that you're able to join. Um, that made it much more interesting experience for me too. Uh, so I appreciate you being here. And, and for the rest of you, I, I hope you've learned a fair amount. Uh, if there's anything that is confusing or still not clear, again, just get in touch and we will do the best we can to help. Is the rigging handbook available online? nynjtc.com. Yes, it is. Um, uh, I hate our website. And so the best way to find it is just to type in NYNJTC rigging handbook. And then the result will come up. If you try to nav navigate and find it through the website, you will sink into a black hole from which you will never return. Uh, so yeah, Google's your friend. Uh, will you be posting uh, some of these links again, adding more links than from the uh, first part? like the rigging handbook and the uh, and the trail services catalog and so on. Sure, yeah, we can repost that in, a, in an email, the stuff that we did before, as well as, uh, you know, some of the newer resources we're mm -hmm. pulling from. Um, and uh, make as much of it available to you all as, as, as possible. That's great.
Thank you. Okay, Good thank class. you so much, everyone.